Now, in the past, we've talked about a number of things regarding the turret and the operation of the 14-inch guns. We've talked about how they were pointed and trained. We talked about how ammunition was brought up from below and how it was loaded into the guns. We've even talked about how the barrels themselves were constructed. But what we haven't talked about is what happens when you fire that gun. What happens to that projectile to make it leave the barrel? Now, he, there's a, it's a radical environment. Uh, that projectile only takes about 55 thousandths of a second from the moment that that uh, is initiated till the time it leaves the barrel. During that time, and the, tra uh, the distance of 45 feet that it moves through the rifled bore, it goes from zero to 1,840 miles per hour. It goes from no rotation at all to a rotation of 5,500 RPM. Now, that exposes it to several thousand g's of acceleration for it, force. Now how in the world can it survive that? Well it did and in fact it survived well enough to where it was able to fly accurately and follow a predetermined ballistic path to its target. So we're going to talk about the components involved, the projectile the shell, the uh, powder and powder bags, the primers, the fiber lock that was used to fire that primer and get the whole thing going. And we're going to do that over a couple of videos. So we'll cut the video off here and we'll go inside turn one where we can take a look at a projectile sitting on a tray and we'll get a good close up look and description of that. What we're looking at here is a 1,275 pound high capacity round. This is a general purpose high explosive shell that was used on soft targets. Uh, whether it's unarmored ships or uh, land targets, open uh, troop concentrations, uh, truck concentrations, open gun emplacements, that kind of thing. The other type of uh, projectile that was used was an armored piercing round that was used to, to defeat hardened targets, whether it was armor on ships to pillboxes with concrete reinforcement, that kind of thing. Now, it required two very different designs to accomplish the two sets of purposes, but they did share some uh, important characteristic features. Uh, we're going to break this down, and first of all, from the nose of the shell back to uh, here is called the ogive. This is the curved part of the shell that follows a very precise formula to give best aerodynamic efficiency. Now, what you can't see is right here there's a slight bulge in the shell. This is called the borelet. This, along with the driving band, were the only two points of the shell that actually touched the inside of the bore, or what are called the rifling lands. And this was important because this minimized the amount of friction of the shell moving through the barrel. And so that uh, uh, it promoted the maximum amount of acceleration as the shell moved through the bore. Now, I've already uh, mentioned the driving band. The driving band, uh, arguably, is the most important feature of the shell, and we're going to go into that in much greater detail. And then finally, we have this base of the shell, and they're uh, mounted in that on the back. is the base plug uh, location and where the uh, what's called a base detonating fuse was, was mounted, and also the indentions used to attach lifting eyes that would allow the shell to be transported. Let's take a closer look at the driving band. Arguably, I feel like this is the most important feature of the shell because this is what, in a sense, makes everything happen. Uh, this was made of a copper alloy and it served actually four different functions. Let me move the raw light around to where hopefully it becomes a little more obvious. If you look at the forward edge of that, you'll see that it's tapered. As the shell was rammed home, uh, the first uh, that taper was what hit the um, the forward slope or the uh, compression slope in the powder chamber and ease that driving band into it. Now behind that you'll see that there's four raised points. There's one there's one right at the back of the uh, taper itself, then there's two more behind that, and then a third that's uh, the forward part of that skirt. As the projectile was fired and started moving through the bore, the rifling cut into those raised bands in a process known as engraving and since that rifling is spiraled as it moved that's what grabbed the shell and forced it to spin up from zero to 5500 rpm. Now directly behind that is that raised skirt and if you look you'll see that it's actually kind of hollow behind it. Now this skirt uh, 
provided what was called a gas check. Remember, those pressures could reach 36,000 PSI behind that shell. And what you had to prevent was the, uh, those hot gases shooting past that skirt. And so what had happened was when that pressure built, it would force that skirt open to where it sealed tightly against the bore and acted as a gas check. Without that, uh, the gases sh squirting by the shell would uh, prevent the shell from reaching its maximum velocity. And even worse, hot gases uh, cutting, jetting through uh, between the shell and the bore could do what was called gas cutting uh, and would damage the bore. The other thing that that uh, skirt did was when the, the projectile was rammed to its final position in the bore, it jammed up against the forward or per, uh, compression slope in the powder chamber and literally jammed the shell in place so that it was uh, held fast when the barrel was elevated and it wouldn't slide back against the powder bags. So you can see this required a very careful design. There's one last feature. You see these three grooves that are cut, cut between those bands and then that uh, hollow space behind the skirt. There's an extremely good reason for those being there. Just because you cut that and, and uh, engrave those bands doesn't, uh, doesn't mean that you don't have to do something with the uh, copper that was displaced. It doesn't just disappear. Well, what those grooves did is it provided a place for that copper to flow. And by doing that, the copper wasn't left as residue in the bore that not only fouled the bore, but in extreme cases could cause what was called uh, copper choking that would increase pressure in the bore even to enough levels to where the gun barrel itself could be damaged. Now that we have an idea of common design characteristics, let's take a look at the two shell types, their individual features, and how they're made. The first things to notice is that the high capacity shell is made from a single forged casting while the armor piercing shell has a two piece design. Even more noteworthy is the armor piercing shell has a very small explosive charge of a little under 23 pounds while the high capacity shell has almost five times more. These two features are the keys to their difference in function. The armor piercing shell is immediately identified by a black painted body and its explosive defiller is identified by the yellow nose. This shell has a particularly difficult role to fill. It must punch through large thicknesses of Class A surface hardened armor and penetrate deep inside a ship before exploding to destroy critical components and disable or sink the target. Defeating high quality armor is equivalent to an irresistible force meeting an immovable object. To do so, it cannot simply punch a hole through the armor, it must crash through using the immense force of millions of foot-pounds of kinetic energy contained within its mass and speed, surviving the collision intact enough to continue its trip deep into the ship. This cannot be done using a shell having a pointed nose. The design concentrates too much of the shock of impact in the tiny area where the nose strikes the armor. The inevitable result is the shell will shatter on the armor without penetrating. Another problem with a pointed nose is shell striking angle. Practically all shell strikes happen at some angle. The further the shell has to travel to the target, the higher the striking angle will be, and it doesn't take much of an angle for the shell to simply deflect or ricochet off of the armor's face. The solution is to use a blunt nose that spreads out enough energy to survive impact, but still concentrated enough to shatter the armor. By using a broad flat ogive, the shell will also be less likely to deflect off of the armor. If it all works right, the shell will crash through the armor and survive intact enough to smash its way through decks and bulkheads to penetrate deep inside the ship. Once there, its explosive filler will detonate and send razor sharp chunks of steel flying at high speeds that will destroy equipment and kill crew. Let's take a closer look at how the shell and its components go together to accomplish this seemingly impossible task. We start with a body that consists of a heavy forged casting made from what is essentially annealed steel. This gives it a softness that will not shatter or break up when it hits an extremely hard surface. However, it's too soft to penetrate. It needs something else. Coming from the forge, it's machined to provide the proper clearance in the bore, including a borelette that is precisely 23 one thousandths of an inch smaller than the barrel's rifling. A wide cantilever or groove is machined close to the base for the driving band. The groove surface is also cross-hatched to give the driving band a better grip so that it will stay firmly attached to the shell when it's forced to spin.
Next comes an armored cap that is soldered and crimped onto the body. It's made from hardened steel that is capable of breaking through armor. Why harden just a cap and not the entire shell? A fully hardened steel body will be too brittle and will shatter when it strikes the armor. The concept of a hardened cap design transfers much of the impact shock through the cap and into the softer body so that it will remain intact. Next comes the driving band that is installed using an incredibly complex radial press that clamps it onto the shell with immense force. This is critical since it must grip well enough to transfer a spin of 5500 RPM into a 1500 pound shell in only 55 one thousandths of a second. One thing that should be pretty obvious is that the blunt nose will offer a terrible amount of wind resistance to the shell's flight, so a windshield made from very heavy gauge steel is added. This gives the nice smooth ogive needed for good aerodynamics. With that, major assembly is complete, but there are a few final steps. 22.9 pounds of explosive filler is poured in and allowed to set, then the base plug is installed to seal the shell. Last but not least, a time delay base detonating fuse is screwed into place. Locating it in the shell's base protects it from certain destruction that would occur if it was mounted in the nose. Being a time delay fuse, it will wait 35 thousandths of a second after impact with the armor to give the shell enough time to reach deep within the ship before detonating. This completes the shell. It is then either warehoused at an ammunition depot or sent to a ship ready for use. There's a problem with armor piercing shells. The shock of impact with a ship having little or no armor may not be enough to trigger the fuse. If that happens, the shell will very likely penetrate entirely through the ship creating little damage. The solution for that problem is the high capacity shell that is designed to explode with great force against soft targets even though it stands little or no chance of succeeding against heavy armor. Even though it has no cap, it will readily penetrate the thin hull of an unarmored ship where its instant detonation and heavy exploding charge can create immense destruction deep inside. Let's take a close look at its components and how it goes together. Like the armor piercing shell, we start with a forged casting. Unlike the AP shell, the body consists of only one piece that has an open nose and base. Both openings are machined and threaded to accept nose and base plugs. The next step is to machine the shell's outer surface, the borelette, and cantilever for the driving band much the same way it's done on an AP shell. A nose plug is screwed in to close the nose of the shell and the driving band is installed using the same type radial press used to install it on AP shells. An explosive charge of almost 105 pounds is now poured in, allowed to set, and the base plug screwed into place. The last step is to install a base detonating fuse that is designed to explode as soon as the shell impacts its target. With that, the shell is complete and ready to store at an ammunition depot or sent to a ship. Even though the shell is fully functional at this point, it isn't necessarily the shell's final configuration. While on the loading tray and just before being rammed into the gun's breech, the shell's nose plug was frequently removed and a point detonating fuse installed. By 1944, the fuse would have been a Mark 29 impact fuse that greatly decreased the possibility of failure in a dud. They could also install a Mark 62 time fuse. Time of flight information calculated on a range keeper in the main battery plotting room would be telephoned to a loader. Using that, a time was set on the fuse that made it burst immediately prior to reaching its target. This would create an air burst that produced a heavy blast and more than 1,000 pounds of razor sharp fragments that shredded open targets like troop concentrations and truck convoys. There was a third shell we haven't discussed that was used by the ship during the North Africa landings that never used again. The bombardment shell had a solid nose that did not accept a point detonating fuse and it held slightly less explosive filler than a high capacity shell. It also suffered a high rate of duds. Between those shortcomings and a need to modify shell hoist on Texas to accept it, the high capacity round took its place for the remainder of the war. So there you have it, a good look at the 14 inch projectiles used on Texas. Check back for videos in the near future that will discuss other components needed to fire it, the powder charge, the primer, and the firing lock.